Good morning, everyone. So glad that you could join us. Last week, Pastor Dave commenced our new series by focusing on the covenant of marriage. We learnt that a covenant was a chosen relationship where people made binding promises to each other. We saw that all three persons of the Trinity have experienced perfect intimacy and submission. And God's dream for the marriage covenant was to duplicate his own experience of intimacy. God's design for marriage was threefold, companionship, sexual expression, and for partners to help each other. Now, you and I know that there are no perfect marriages because there are no perfect people. Men and women fail to live up to God's ideal. Not only do all marriage partners experience disappointment at times, in some cases, the relationship becomes severely damaged. And that's why this morning we're endeavouring to get a biblical perspective on the topic when the marriage covenant breaks down. A few of the areas we will try to cover are, what does the Bible say about divorce? Does it give legitimate grounds for divorce? Is remarriage acceptable after divorce? How should the church respond to those with a broken relationship in their midst? Marriages break up for so many deeply painful reasons. In some, one or both partners stop investing in their relationship. In others, one partner abandons their spouse for another person, sometimes one of the same gender as themselves. Others are destroyed by sexual misconduct, pornography, affairs, frequenting prostitutes. Some suffer because of narcissistic behaviour, domestic violence, and the damage caused by severe mental health. I have known a marriage breakdown because the husband felt uncomfortable in his own gender and began to live as a woman. Let's not be naive. These are all situations occurring in Christian marriages. First up, I want to acknowledge that for numerous members of our church family, these first two topics of our Becoming Whole series are highly sensitive. It has taken courage to be here. And no doubt last week, for some of you, your grief was triggered as you realised again that God's dream and design for marriage has not been fulfilled in the relationship you entered into in faith. Some of you would have been reduced to tears. Several in our midst have already experienced the breakdown of marriage and subsequent divorce. Others of you are currently struggling with relationship dysfunction and can't see the way ahead. My prayer is you will hear both truth and grace, that you will be comforted by the truth that God can bring beauty from brokenness, and that his promises to abandon, not to abandon his own, never fail. From the outset, I also need to say that the topics of marriage breakdown and divorce are complex. On the cover of a book I read, it said this, The Bible provides some clear answers, but grey areas remain. And this is highlighted by Dr. Ward Powers, who is a Sydney Anglican and a Greek scholar. He was awarded his PhD from the University of London for his research in the field of New Testament teaching relating to sex, marriage and divorce. He emphasises the great diversity of opinion within the church when marriage breakup occurs. In fact, he identifies 11 different viewpoints or positions. However, he narrows them down into three groups. The first group consists of those who claim that marriage is indissoluble by nature and a legal divorce does not change one's marital status before God. 
Therefore, for them, remarriage is adultery. The Roman Catholic position um, is an example of this. They believe that even if you go through a divorce, you are still married in heaven. And the divorced are refused participation in confession and Eucharist, which we call communion. The second group allows divorce in certain circumstances, but they differ as to the grounds for divorce. Adultery only, or adultery plus desertion, or both these and a number of others. There are also differing views on remarriage. Neither party, only the innocent, or both parties. The third group looks at the biblical teaching of lifelong monogamy as desirable as a desirable ideal that is difficult to attain in the real world of human feelings and failings. They say people's freedom should not be restricted by rules derived from an ideal. People should learn from their marriage breakup, get a divorce and try again. Well, I want us to turn to the scriptures and I think you can appreciate in the short time we have, we can't look at many, many references, but I've narrowed them down. The first reference is in the Old Testament from Deuteronomy 24, 1 to 4. We read this. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, he may write her a certificate of divorce and give it to her and send her from his house. And if after she leaves his house she becomes the wife of another man and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Now this is a hypothetical case. Moses here is not initiating divorce, but regulating it. And by preventing reunion, the legislation would discourage divorce and afford the woman some protection. The husband had to be really sure that he wanted to get rid of his wife, that he wanted the relationship to end. And on the certificate would be written, Behold, you are free to marry another man. This regulation would also strengthen her second marriage. The wife could not simply decide to go back to her former spouse, nor could her former husband claim her at whim. He couldn't expect her to be waiting around for him. God wanted marriage and divorce to be seen as serious and permanent. Another Old Old Testament reference is Jeremiah 3, verses 8 and 9. We won't read it, but it tells us that God speaks of himself as a divorcee who knows the heartache of unfaithfulness. He gave Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away. Another Old Testament verse that is frequently um, spoken is Malachi 2, verse 16. Unfortunately, often only the first half is quoted, God hates divorce. The context was the Israelites abandoning their wives in favour of women from foreign nations. It was exactly the abandonment that God experienced because of Israel's spiritual apostasy. However, this verse finishes in this way. Therefore, keep watch on your spirit so that you do not deal treacherously with your wife. And you will find in modern translations that actually it's the man who's spoken of as hating and divorcing his wife And God says the man does violence to the one he should protect. But what about the New Testament? 
We're going to turn to Matthew 19, 1 to 9. And there is a very similar passage in Mark 10. Only in that one, Jesus includes the case of a woman divorcing her husband. Actually, in Jewish culture, a woman couldn't initiate divorce. But as one writer pointed out, there were ways a woman could induce her husband to divorce her. So let's read that passage. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of Jordan. Large crowds followed him there and he healed them. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away. Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. It's really important for us to understand the context and cultural background to this conversation. In Jesus' time, there were three differing interpretations of Moses' law in Deuteronomy 24. One group accepted the need for grounds of sexual immorality for divorce. A second group, the school of Hillel, interpreted indecency or uncleanness in the old versions to be almost anything, including burning the dinner. A third group, later known as Rabbi Akiba's school, said it was acceptable to divorce if you found another woman more attractive. And so any cause divorce was becoming increasingly popular. But the question posed to Jesus was not a genuine one. It was a test. The Pharisees hoped that either Jesus would make light of Moses' law or he would lose popularity because of his opposition to the contemporary divorce practices. You see, Jesus never criticised the law, but he did criticise the way the religious leaders diluted it or broke the moral principles of the law with their oral traditions. And if you want to see, look at that, you can turn to Matthew chapter 15. Well, in response to their question, Jesus went back to Genesis and first principles. He spoke of God's intention for marriage and he finished with a very forceful statement. And they were kind of hoping he would do something like this. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. The Greek word that is translated separate is chorizo. And it means to tear asunder, to divide, to split or to separate oneself from. We need to understand this is not the same concept as modern-day divorce, which is the legal process of annulling a marriage that is initiated by either party. We call it divorce, but it's very different to Carrizo. You see, divorce isn't the sin. The sin is the breaking of the marriage vows the behaviours and attitudes that damage and ultimately destroy the marriage relationship. 
The Pharisees didn't want to leave it there. So they challenged Jesus about Moses' supposed command to give wives a certificate of divorce. And Jesus picked up on that word and replied, Moses permitted or allowed you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. Jesus was emphasizing that the certificate of divorce was a necessary concession for when human sinfulness failed to meet the ideal. And then Jesus said these words, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual adultery, immorality and makes another... Then Jesus said these words, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Now, Ward Powers points out that while most translations use the word except, it is not actually in the original Greek. And so the sentence should read something like this, and I realise it sounds a little awkward. Anyone who divorces his wife not for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Ward Powers argues that Jesus is not supplying grounds for divorce, but simply making a negative statement on the topic of a man divorcing his innocent wife because he fancies another woman. Now, we could argue, well, sexual immorality is mentioned, so does it really make any difference to the meaning? And I just want to um, point out here that the word for sexual immorality is porneia. And it actually covers a wide range of sexual misconduct, not simply adultery. It includes prostitution, incest, homosexuality, bestiality. And Grudem suggests that in today's context, it could include things like frequenting strip clubs on a regular basis and ongoing addiction to pornography. If Jesus' statement read as Powers suggests it should, it would clarify the intent of Jesus' reply. That is, that he was condemning the practice of groundless divorce as an invalid one that makes remarriage in adultery. It would also strengthen the truth that God's desire was for marriage to be a lifelong monogamous relationship. Now, many individuals and churches have clutched at the word except, and they have interpreted this verse as saying that divorce for any other reason other than unfaithfulness is ruled out and all remarriage is wrong. The outcome has been judgmental attitudes and harsh legalistic church policies. But what about the New Testament? Again, we can only concentrate on just a few passages. I want to turn to Paul and his words on divorce and remarriage in 1 Corinthians 7. In the two chapters before this, Paul has spoken extensively about sexual immorality to this church that was gifted but not in the healthiest condition. Listen to what one source said about this church in Corinth. A church will inevitably reflect to some extent the society in which it exists. The church in Corinth existed in a grossly sinful atmosphere. Many of the problems of the church found their basis in the life of the city. Most of the members of the church were Gentiles and the strict morality characteristic of the Jews was foreign to them. They found it difficult to understand what they once considered virtue was now sin. It seems that while he was writing this letter, Paul received one from the Corinthians asking his opinion 
on various issues, including incest and Christian marriage. And so chapter 7 commences, Now in response to the matters you wrote about. Our problem is that we don't know the full context or the specific questions asked. And so we make assumptions based on Paul's responses. Early in this chapter, it appears that there has been a suggestion from Corinth that if married people are to be really Christian, they must abstain from all sexual relations with each other. Well, Paul's response was, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. And while Paul expressed the view that he wished that all men were like himself, that is, unmarried, and I must point out that it is considered he was married at an earlier stage but was probably a widower now, he recognised that both celibacy and marriage were gifts. Paul was quick to tell both husbands and wives that marriage was for the gratification of both their desires. Paul was very aware of the temptation to immorality. But let's read the verses that follow. 1 Corinthians 7, 8 to 16. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single, as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does... She should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases... The brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? And I have to point out that the first two sections of this passage have caused controversy and disagreement amongst scholars and church leaders. Let's look at three sections. First one. Paul begins by speaking to the unmarried. The Greek word agamos is used here and it is the only time in the New Testament that it is used. It means people not at present married or no longer married. Some commentators assume that the unmarried are widows, widowers, and those who have never been married before, the virgins that Paul um, speaks to later on. Others disagree. They believe the unmarried includes divorcees. And think about it. This is highly likely, given the church was largely comprised of Gentiles who had come to faith out of an immoral culture. And it was a culture that equated separation with divorce. Paul counsels that they should get married if the celibate life is proving too difficult. Effectively, Paul is saying remarriage is acceptable. And we must remember that in the first century, divorce always included the right to remarry. There is no blanket prohibition on remarriage in the Bible. 
And in those places where we find lists of sins, like murder, malice, homosexuality, greed, and so on, remarriage is never included. The second section is where Paul refers to someone whose marriage was clearly in trouble. He advises her not to separate, but then adds, if she does, she should remain unmarried or seek reconciliation. Ward Powers believes that Paul is trying to prevent a hasty decision. Reconciliation should always be the primary goal. He also believes Paul advocates taking time in order to assess whether or not one has the gift of celibacy, as he did. The difficulty for us is Paul does not specify how much time to take before one concludes the relationship is irreparable. And this has led some commentators and church leaders to take the position that divorcees should remain unmarried for life. But logically, we have to ask ourselves, if God said in Genesis, it is not good for man to be alone, does divorce mean that the desires which marriage were designed to fulfill now no longer apply? One writer says this, there is no reason to deduce that we get one chance at marriage and if we mess it up, that's it. When Paul says in a later verse, speaking to both the unmarried and virgins, but if you do marry, you have not sinned, he does not qualify it by saying, unless you are a divorcee. And in the third section, Paul goes on to address the spouse married to an unbeliever who wants to leave the relationship. And he says, but if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. Most scholars conclude from these verses that willful desertion is grounds for divorce. But there's a question that many people raise. Are sexual immorality and willful desertion the only biblical grounds for divorce? What about domestic violence in its various expressions? Wayne Grudem is an American evangelical theologian, a seminary professor and an author who once staunchly saw adultery and desertion as the only two legitimate grounds for divorce. However, in 2019, he conducted new research into 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15, focusing on the sentence, in such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. The Greek phrase translated in such cases does not appear anywhere else in the New Testament or in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Grudem discovered, however, that it did occur in Greek literature outside the Bible and the phrase referred to a broader category of cases than the specific example. And so Grudem concludes that in using the expression in such cases, Paul is talking about other circumstances that are similar to, but not exactly like desertion and adultery. Similar or even greater than in the level of damage and destruction they cause. Grudem feels in the light of this, Legitimate grounds for divorce include abuse, verbal and relational cruelty, incorrigible addictions, and serious threats of harm or murder. And David Instone Brewer would agree. He's a research fellow at Tyndale House. He says that the Bible gives those suffering in a marriage encouragement to persevere, but also a safety net 
when one finds that they cannot cope anymore. And I quote, Sometimes divorce is necessary to end the sinfulness of repeated and unrepentant breaking of the marriage vows. So given what we have seen in scripture, how should we respond to those with broken marriages and the experience of divorce? So often the church has dealt with victims of marriage breakup with judgment, harshness and even total rejection. But what about grace? Look at the beautiful example of Jesus in John 4 in his intentional encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well. Because of the stigma of both her past and present circumstances, she was there at a time when other villagers were not likely to come. And at one point in the conversation, Jesus told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. She had been married and divorced five times, and Jesus acknowledged each of those men as her husbands, and she was now in a de facto relationship. As we saw in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus strongly upheld God's dream and design for the marriage covenant. And yet he engaged with this woman so graciously. What's more, she was the first person to whom he revealed his messiahship. What is so amazing to me is the fact that she ran back to the town saying to the people in boldness and excitement, not crushed by judgment, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. And I am sure some of them were saying, well, everything you ever did is definitely not good. You know, marriage breakdown is not the unforgivable sin of Matthew 12, 13. J. Adams, in his book on divorce and remarriage, makes a comment of vital importance to the church. He says we must preserve two biblical truths. Firstly, sin is heinous. Secondly, grace is greater than the most heinous sin. I once saw a book with the title, Why Do Christians shoot their wounded. And I think that title is so applicable to our topic this morning. Let me ask a few questions. Why are we so quick to judge those whose relationships have broken down? I think particularly of victims of domestic violence who so often have not been believed or supported by the church, but rather told to return to the destructive relationship and submit. That's spiritual abuse. Why are we so slow to extend grace when we see their pain? Are we driven by a desirable theological outcome? Do we truly believe that in Christ there is complete forgiveness for the sin that caused the breakdown where true repentance exists. And it could be the sin of one or the sin of both. Do we believe in the love of God that not only forgives, but heals and transforms and brings new hope? Or are we afraid that the grace we extend will be misconstrued and abused? I read that in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, Philip Yancey tells the story of a Christian friend who confided that he intended to leave his wife and children because he'd found someone else who made him feel more alive than he'd ever been before. He said to Yancey, do you think God can forgive the terrible thing I'm about to do? 
He condemned himself with those words. Yancey had to point out that there was a difference between asking God to condone sin and receiving forgiveness when truly repentant. Yes, the risk is real. God's grace can be abused, but we can't hold back for fear of that. And it's helpful to remember that sometimes we are the ones who abuse his grace. To finish this morning, I thought we would just have a quiet time of guided reflection and personal prayer. And I'm going to give you some things to reflect on and some things to pray about. And then I'll conclude. Reflect on God's dream and design for the covenant of marriage. In what areas could you and I honour it more faithfully? Think about God's identification with those experiencing the pain of relationship breakdown, his compassion towards the wounded. And remember that Jesus was called the friend of tax collectors and sinners. Reflect on Paul's encouragement to seek reconciliation where possible in a relationship that is strained. Take some time to examine yourself. Ask, am I guilty of self-righteousness and a lack of grace towards others? Do I need to ask for forgiveness where I have abused God's grace in a particular area of my life? And now just for a few minutes, let's stop to pray. Pray for those in our family carrying the pain of past marriage breakdown. Pray for those struggling in a damaging relationship. Pray that our marriages will be counter-cultural. Just give you a couple of minutes to pray quietly before I conclude. Father, we thank you for the law and grace approach of the Bible to divorce and remarriage. Father, we pray for ourselves. When we reflect on the ideal of marriage that Jesus espoused, we recognize that we are all guilty of failing through selfishness, through wrong motives, through hardness of heart. Lord, our hearts go out to those in our midst who have already suffered the heartache of marriage breakdown and divorce. We think of those here this morning who are struggling with the dysfunction and the pain in their own relationship. We ask for those who can't see a way ahead. Lord, we rejoice in the fact that Jesus graciously engaged with the woman at the well. That gives us hope. That gives us an example. Lord, would you comfort those who need comfort? Would you bring ongoing healing to those who have been wounded in the past? And would you give each of us a heart of compassion and grace that reaches out to those who are hurting, that prays for them, that cares for them in practical ways. Thank you for your word to us this morning. Amen.